on meeting mode because we were hoping we could be more interactive. We've been having the sessions. We haven't been seeing who's on the call, but today we get to see who's here and um, enjoy interacting with one another. So feel free to um, put on your video. And if you have questions, you can raise your hand. Kevin will see and he can give you an opportunity to speak. Um, we will go through a couple of things. Then after every section, that's when we can have the Q&A. So um, welcome and I guess we can get started. So I'm just going to quickly share my screen. Kevin, if you will allow me to share my screen. Okay, one moment. Do you try now? Okay, cool. Let me try again. Okay, cool. All right. So let's get started. So today we're going to discuss um, ISP network design. So just go over an overview of how ISPs are set up, how what their design looks like, what would be a good um, best practice for you as you think of maybe setting up your ISP or as you're running your ISP. Um, I did share the slides on the WhatsApp. I hope you got them if you're interested in following along. And um, We'll get to where we get to, hopefully it will be the end. If not, um, we can carry on um, on another occasion. Um, so these materials that I'm using are being prepared by um, a good friend of mine, Philip Smith and uh, Barry Green, and also with help from Marketing Calcicum, and they're open to anyone to use them anytime they want to for the purposes of training. So that's why we are going to be going over this today. So we're going to look at um, okay, Kevin, sorry. <laughs> I'm getting this distracting things of people need to be admitted. So okay, let, me, get rid of it. Let, let me reclaim host just one minute. Uh, okay. Just a minute. Mm. All right, cool. Um, Yes, so what we're going to look at today, um, we're going to look at um, the pop topologies and design, and then we'll look at um, how to design your backbone or what would be a good practice. And then we'll look at how to address your network. Um, then some routing protocols that we would want to implement those on your network. And then also look at some infrastructure and routing security considerations that you want to take in order to secure your network. Uh, we'll try to get to out of band management, test network, and operational, other operational considerations if we do have the time. Um, so we'll jump right in because we have a lot to go over. We have a point of presence on topology and design. So our point of presence is just basically somewhere where you've set up your network and you've decided that this is the point where all my service we need from your office, whole data center you've set up or server room in your space, or be a cabinet in a data center somewhere, right? So in your pop, you probably have something like a, a core router, um, which you use to connect everything to, and then distribution uh, routers, which you now use to aggregate all the services that you have across the network. Then you can have access routers where um, your customers are able to connect in order to get their services. Um, then you have border routers, which are which you could use for connecting to other providers, right? So either your transit provider or your other ISP that carries you. And um, yes, then you can also have your service routers, which will be hosting kind of the, the infrastructure or the resources that you have on your network that you provide as a service to others. So if it's like hosting, or even like virtual servers, those will be connected to your service router. 
So some of these things, obviously, you can do on one router. It doesn't mean you have to go and buy um, six routers just to have a pop, and then you have a good ISP. Some of these um, functions can be done by the, the same router, but this is just kind of the modularity you want to think about in terms of um, your core. These are some of the actions you want to be taking. So with that said, um, a modular design is going to be very essential for your network. You want to be able to um, differentiate your different, um, your different services uh, between your customers, your different areas of your network. And you want to be able to control this and um, give customers something that would be able to be reliable. So for instance, we can look at this um, pop design here. And we have the core network, which is sitting at the center there of the cloud. Um, and the core network, even as the two devices are sitting there, they don't actually have to be in the same physical place. You can have one major pop, say, in Nairobi, and you have another major pop in um, Mombasa, right? Which are all interconnected all interconnected and then they're connected to your border routers where you get access to the internet exchange point or even your core router could almost also be your border router right then from your core routers where you connect to all these other um, resources and infrastructure that you have available so from your core router you have a link to your other pops right interconnecting them and then behind your core router is where you have um, all your other services sitting there so you'll have if you're hosting a CDN, um, let's say you have a Google cache on your network, it's going to sit here behind your core router and all these aggregated customer services, which have maybe come from your, your metro, your different buildings or distribution points across um, the city or the area which you serve, you can all um, bring those all back to connect back straight into your core. Or if you're doing mobile network services, those would also go back to your core and um, any other services that you're offering your customers, whether it's DNS, um, mail, hosted services, those can be connected back to your core as well, um, and the like, right? So that's in terms of physically how you would lay everything out. Um, and even still at your network, you're going to have um, routing, right? And your routing also has to consider a modular approach as well, because you're going to want to separate how you how you learn about um, your infrastructure IPs. So your infrastructure IPs are those ones which you're using to address your point to points, for instance, or even the IPs you give, the loopback IPs for devices, um, all of those, you want those to be in um, an IGP. An IGP is just an interior gateway protocol and usually there are two that most people use, there are others, but there's ISIS and there's um, OSPF. So for ISIS, um, the good thing about ISIS is that you can have both IPv4 and IPv6 in one process, but for OSPF, you'd have to use version two and version three. So version two doesn't support IPv6, uh, while version three does. So if you're running ISIS as your IGP, you're going to have to use um, V2 and V, I mean, version two and version three, if you want to do a dual stack network or run to run IPv6. So having that separate is very important and we'll look deeper into this when we get to the routing um, section. Um, then also having an IGP. So IBGP in this case, will, BGP is the border gateway protocol, right? So this protocol is more stable. It's not always going to be reconverging. So IGP lets you know and reroutes quickly when there's a failure. So if a link goes down, it will quickly recalculate what's the best path now and change that and inform all its neighbors and traffic will change flow. Uh, BGP is a bit more stable. It won't always make an update as quickly. It also has longer timers. And um, you can use now BGP to carry any other thing that isn't a link um, IP address, OK? So if you've assigned your customers some address space, you want to put that into BGP. If you have your servers, you've assigned them a subnet and you want to get that information across your network, you want to do that via BGP, right? So you have more stability and you're not constantly reconverging your network. If you only use an IGP, you'll constantly be reconverging whenever there's a fault. So keeping those two separate ensures that your customers have a more stable service from you. 
Um, do you have any questions up to there in that first part that we've covered? Feel free to raise your hand. Okay. I guess we'll go into it. Maybe we'll get more questions as we go along. So, so we're looking at now the, the details of um, your point to point of presence design. Um, you want to have, like we saw in the network diagram, you want to have at least um, two returns and you want to have some redundancy there so that you're not, um, you're able to do stuff like maintenance, for instance. If I had to maintain my router, say I have to do a software upgrade, I would have to turn off everyone if I'm maintaining my core router. I'd have to turn off all the services just to do that. So having at least two redundant ones allows me to do a maintenance on one or even if one fails or has an issue, you can fail over to the, to the other available router. So it becomes important to have um, that level of redundancy. And then you want to have high speed connections, right? I don't think um, anyone's doing 100 MB anymore. So at least one gigabit. And the difference in price between a one gig port and a 10 gig port is very low. So at this point, you could probably afford to just put 10 G ports onto your core router. And for this, we said you'll only have your backbone links. So you're having the links that are interconnecting all your pops. And you typically don't want to constantly be touching them, right? This is something which is very stable. Once you've put in a backbone link, you're not, it's not something you're constantly updating. So you, in most cases, don't want to have, um, let's say your customer service terminating on your, directly on your core router, because that means you'll be constantly reconfiguring it as you turn up their services, which can lead to outages. So you want to keep that very separate and very specific in your pop, right? To make sure that it simply serves the function of interconnecting all your services and that's it, not customer access. So the specification for the type of router you'd be wanting to look at is something that's probably high performance and it's able to handle um, a lot of CPU cycles. You want to be able to um, carry all these um, different services and offer line rate, right? For if it's a 10G, you want to be able to give 10G um, services on that router without having any uh, packet loss or instability or the CPU going to 100% and being overutilized. Then um, for the speed of the interfaces, like I said, um, there's a much difference between one and 10 gig. So if you can get 10 gig, do that. And as you grow, if you can get 100 gig, you'd rather be at 100 gig than 10 gig once you have a large enough network. Then for your border network, this is where you're interconnecting to other providers. And assuming your border router is separate from what you're using for your core router, you still want something that gives you high speed, right? Because then you're going to be connecting to your transits and your transits um, could be giving you the full routing table, which requires a lot of resources from your router. It has to be able to store um, the full routing table for both V4 and V6, which is quite a number of routes, I think. We're at 800 and something thousand now. And assuming you have two, even two transit providers, it means you get two copies of the full routing table, which means you have uh, 1.6 million routes. And as it increases with the number of um, transits that you have, and also you're also picking up routes from your peers, which means you should be able to handle that as well without being unable to program the routes into memory. So on these routers, you're going to be doing your BGP policy as well. And your BGP policy will determine how your traffic will flow, what kind of announcements you're accepting from, let's say, your peers in your transit. And it's very demanding on that. And so definitely want it to be redundant if possible, and you want it to be highly available. So um, typically you don't, you're not going to need a very large router for this, just a one U router will probably do most of the times or two U um, and you'd have at least 10 gig back to your core, uh, 10 gig to the exchange or one to 10 gig, depending on the scale of uh, the size of your network. Then you want to have ethernet services probably to your service providers. And this is going to probably be over fiber, right? because you're not going to be using um, UTP cables for this or ethernet cables. So it has to have fiber ports for sure. Um, 
then um, for your border router, some networks would consider having a separate router to connect to um, their peers or to the internet exchange point. The internet exchange point is just um, it's internet infrastructure that allows service providers to share um, their routes with one another and interconnect with one another. So it's typically a switch. You'll find it at a data center for the most part. And you'd want to be at one, which is in a carrier neutral data center, which means any provider can be there. Anyone can interconnect with anyone and there are no rules against that. So um, some would want to have a dedicated one simply for that, just to make sure they never mix their transit with their peering and they never have mistakes, you know, giving someone a service that they shouldn't. But it's not really necessary if you want to, that's, that's possible. Others would separate that traffic in, let's say, a VRF or something. Um, again, you want something that's able to handle the full routing table and can apply policy and be able to do some DDoS mitigation, right? Where you can do um, drop some traffic, which is inappropriate for your network. You want to stop it there. So it should be able to handle quite a bit of traffic without falling over as well. So in general, like um, the amount of peering traffic versus transit. So peering is considered free traffic, right? So the amount of peering traffic in most networks is about um, three to one. So you'll find that in a network, most in an ISP especially, you'll find that most um, of the destinations that the customers are going to is um, YouTube and Facebook and that type of thing, which will make up about 70% um, of all their traffic. Then about 30% will be all other internet destinations, other things people will be doing. So you can see that it's important to be peering because it actually mm -hmm. saves you money. Then for your customer aggregation routers, you want something which has maybe more interfaces now. These are what you'd have um, for servicing your customers and being able to connect each of the various distribution points you might have across the city or across the neighborhood which you're connecting people. And you want it to have probably more ports than your, your border router would have. So you'd be want to consider having, you know, um, 24 ports at least, right? And then, um, yes, so this is, you can aggregate now the smaller trunks. So you have many 1G trunks coming in, for instance, or 100G, 100 um, MB services coming in, and then you, you'd bundle those up over a 1G or 10G link and interconnect back into your core router, as we said. Um, so yeah, so for customer, um, if you're having your business customers, your business customers will be having, um, okay, for your home users, your home users will not be paying a lot of money, but they still want um, a very reliable service, a very reliable service. Um, they want a very reliable service and for most part you connect, these are customers you can connect with other technologies or cheaper things. You don't have to necessarily give them fiber end to end and you can use things like, um, you know, FTTX, uh, GPON, um, wireless services to your, to your smaller customers or your small business owners. And um, usually they tend to have their peak demand in the evening. So you'd probably want to also profile your, your service to them or your policies or your QoS for them to make sure that in the evening they get an exceptional performance. Although that has now changed with COVID with things kind of leveling out um, across the times of day since we are now living and working from home for the most part. Um, so for the aggregation as well, you want something uh, with many ports to connect them all back to your core. Then, um, like I said, for an, an, uh, an ISP, you're, you're going to want to have um, to host a CDN. We said that majority of your traffic is going to be going to the Googles and the Facebooks and the Akamai's. And they tend to have caches that they're able to give service providers who have reached a certain level of traffic with them. So for the most part, um, each CDN will usually give you all the, all the hardware that you need to connect back to them. So they'll give you a server, they'll give you an ethernet switch, or maybe even a router, which you can now put in your pop, right? Which you've allocated for this. Then they will be able to serve your customers and bring the content closer to them. So they'll just use a little bit of transit to fill the cache 
with a with a frequently requested um, resources or videos or whatever. And then your customers, whenever they want to get this uh, data, it's close, much closer to them because right there at your pop. So the latency is lower, and when your latency is lower, then your throughput is higher. So um, this one, like I said, is usually provided by the operators, and it's based on how much traffic you have towards them. Uh, and basically, it's just a bunch of servers, which then you can connect back to your core or to your border so that the cache can refill itself um, with a request from the providers. Uh, same goes for mobile core. Your mobile core will also just be your servers going back, not your servers, your, your infrastructure, which is connected back into your, your core, which is also uh, part of the modular approach that we're looking at. So in this case, you have your radio network, all going back into your cell gateway, which now goes back into your IP core, and you're able to service your customers in that way. So in terms of um, ISPs, what other services do ISPs offer? Um, so other services that are critical for ISPs to offer is DNS. You want to be able to host your own DNS. I know a lot of uh, people are happy to use 8.8.8.8 and all the others, but it's um, really critical to host your own DNS because um, first of all, it's going to be way closer than Google's DNS to your customers. And it's also going to be more reliable for you. So if Google has an issue and their network is no longer available to you, you're not going to be completely unable to browse, right? Because if you can't translate, that's it. No browsing for you unless you know the IPs to the resources you want. So DNS is an important service that every network operator should consider um, offering and operating on their own network. There are things like uh, mail. Mail, I know there's Google and all that, but um, it's also something which is quite important to host. If you're also able, able to host your own, at least your own mail for your company, um, that can also make you um, a little less reliant on other providers and the failures in the network will not um, affect you critically. Then you can have your website that you're hosting, your customer service portals that you're using. A lot of people have um, self-service for billing, so a customer is able to log in, pay for something, um, that's a service that you can host on your network as well and keep behind your core. Um, uh, yeah, this is just an illustration of how you would have this. So you'd have your core there. You'd have your core routers here, which are then connected to your service routers um, or distribution routers. And then you can have your servers in a cluster, probably you're going to have virtualized them and make sure that you're using just one virtual machine for each service. So don't have one server where you put everything in the world. You want to keep those services compartmentalized so that a failure or compromise in one of them doesn't lead to um, complete uh, failure for every single service that you're hosting for your customers and for yourself. So that's very critical to keep note of. So remember that uh, cloud computing is just someone else's computer. So you can offer that service to your customers. A lot of people need backups they're not, no one's bothering to buy um, those hard disks anymore to store their data. So that's a value added service you can offer to your customer, somewhere for them to back up their services and to do host their websites for them and host their emails on your cloud modules. Um, yeah. So in terms of uh, your NOC, which is the other service that you're having on uh, behind your your core. Your NOC is where all your network monitoring infrastructure sits. So it's directly connected. You don't want your NOC to be um, behind a firewall necessarily, because you want it to be able to um, reach all your resources, all your infrastructure, to be able to get the network monitoring to manage, to check on the traffic flow so that you can tell which are my popular destinations, where's my traffic going, right? And then you're able to manage it and even use this information to get peering. Because for peering, if I can tell that I have a lot of traffic, let's say to Seacom, uh, I can say, okay, Seacom, we have so much traffic to you. Why don't I peer with you, okay? And then you can use, you can get other statistics, obviously from this section of your network, which you consider your NOC. Um, you're able to do remote triggered black holes so you can mitigate um, denial of service attacks. So, and also you can do your out-of-band management 
from your NOG. So it's just an example, uh, a diagram illustrating what we've just discussed. So you have your core routers and behind that, you've given your network operating staff um, access to your network from away from the firewall. It doesn't mean that they don't protect their network with um, their own devices with firewalls and ETC. Then you have your outer band management and then all your other services uh, or all your other servers that are collecting data from your network and monitoring it. Then from there, you can now behind the firewall or your, you can have your corporate LAN where the rest of the um, staff sits and you can have your databases, your billing, your accounting systems there. And those can comfortably sit behind the firewall without impacting their ability to work. So in summary, we said that um, a network operator wants to create a POP which is as modular as possible um, and have a core that is high speed and low maintenance, meaning you're not connecting your customers onto there. You want, once you've um, connected a service or a section of your network there, you're not constantly reconfiguring it. You want to have direct cross connects to every part of your network, if possible, or every other large segment of it. And if possible, you have redundancy for each of your devices that you have in your core. And uh, you can rely on now your routine to do the um, failover for you should there be a failure in any of the devices on the core. So I think with that, we can take questions maybe on the core network design bit. Don't be shy, you can put up your hand, you can speak. Yes, if you have a question, you can unmute yourself. Uh, and, and I think Barak, I saw a question from Barak earlier. Well, let me read it out. Uh, okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, Barak was asking, Michelle, do you have recommendations on good routers to for use at the core? Uh, he's asking for brand names. He's asking you to endorse a brand or... <laughs> That's always a tricky question. I think it really depends on what kind of... Um, what kind of services you want to have from your core, how you're interconnecting. I'm always um, wary of giving someone like, um, you must buy this brand or you should get this particular return. I would say maybe come up with some specifications of what you're looking for in your router. Like we said, a couple of things you want to know is how much CPU is it? How many internet routes can it handle? Um, what's the overall throughput of that device? How is the licensing handled on on the device you're using. There are some which will give you, um, you can use 2.5 gig throughput at any given time on this device. And if you want to do more than that, you must upgrade and pay for a new license. So it depends on so many different factors. Um, but we can always chat on the side, <laughs> depending on what, what you're trying to achieve. Unless someone else wants to venture a suggestion. Yeah, maybe just Simon here, just an addition probably. Um, I think it's very key not to, uh, as Michelle says, uh, not to have a dependency on a vendor. And that's why I think uh, Michelle is trying to, to, uh, to restrain herself from saying uh, uh, Huawei or whoever it is. Eh? Uh, because uh, if something, there's a kind of support that is not given, um, then you might end up uh, having a problem. I think one of the cases that have been discussed in multiple lists is, um, uh, a router like, for example, Microtik. There's a router, I, I'm sure somebody knows, called Microtik. Mm -hmm. Such boxes, they're very good. They have many features. But remember, they never commit to any kind of support. So basically, if something fails, they'll tell you, can you try another firmware? Goodbye. And then you sort yourself. So I think uh, those are some of the things that also you need to, to, to be able to, to, to look at. For example, um, is the router supportable? Uh, is the vendor? able to support you without any problem uh, like uh, uh, in the also? Soft, yeah in terms of software software plans and um, roadmaps yeah thank you yeah cool thank you for that um addition simon uh was there another question kevin yes there's a new question on the chat uh, from samuel 
He's asking, what are the best MTU configurations and practices at various levels of the network? Uh, I think that also depends uh, on who your customers are. For the most part, if you're, it depends who you're also relying on to interconnect you. So at a minimum, you should be able to do 1500, which can do most of the things that you want to do. So obviously any vendor that can't, any operator who can't give you a link between your sites at, with 1500 MTU is, is going to break stuff for you on your network. If you have a provider who's able to give you jumbo frames, then that's even better. But remember the internet is also still best effort. So you might have all that in your network, but once it leaves your network, it'll still go back to probably the, the 1500. So if you're offering an internet service, I just say 1500 will be fine. If you're offering, um, let's say like a carrier kind of service where you're interconnecting your customers branch offices, right? For that, since it's all on your network, you can give them higher MTU. So where you have control, um, give high MTU. And if you don't have control, make sure you have at least 1500. Okay, um, one more question from Tom. How do you determine if the router or switch is struggling to carry traffic as clients increase on the upstream? Well, that's why we talked about uh, NOC, remember? We said we are monitoring our stuff. What you can't monitor, you can't measure, you can't know unless you do some monitoring. So you want to be able to see what's the CPU utilization of your router at any given moment, um, how, how are the interface utilizations, is, are the interfaces flatlining? Um, you'll also be able to tell, am I dropping lots of packets? So that's really a function of monitoring. You have to ensure that you're monitoring your network. Otherwise, a lot of things could happen without you being able to, to tell where it started from, when it started, what caused it. So monitoring is key. And, and, and also, Michelle, it can be more of um, proactive rather than reactive. I think most mm -hmm. of the NMSs, uh, which are even open source, or the ones that you have to buy from a shop, uh, they have the capability for you to be able to configure thresholds. So for mm -hmm. example, if you have your upstreams uh, uh, with one gig or 10 gig, you can be able to configure a threshold that uh, once traffic hits 75% uh, utilization, once the memory uh, uh, for the RAMs that hit, uh, hit like 70% uh, utilization, uh, mm -hmm. CPU usage triggers an, uh, uh, a notification to your email, at least with that, uh, immediately it hits like 75%. Uh, you need to be to be able to, to, to be sure to plan like uh, upgrading or uh, seeing how to scale around. Yeah. Is there any other question? Uh, there is one more question uh, on monitoring tools. Maybe uh, we can take this last question, then you can move to the next uh, part of the, of the tutorial. So question is from Barak. Did you make comments on monitoring tools, especially open source ones, if you could speak on that in a minute? Okay. Um, no, I haven't made any recommendation on monitoring tools. Um, there are very many of them that are available. Like you said, there are many open source ones. Um, and of course, you know, if you're going open source, then you have to be able to configure it and maintain it. So that's also a function of what you are able to easily manage for yourself. But there, there are many open, there are many of them that are very open source. I would recommend probably something well supported. So you want something many people are using, which will have probably a lot of plugins for the things that you want to monitor. So look for the well or commonly used ones and you'll find that those are still very actively supported and they have a good community around them where you can get assistance when you whenever you run into an issue and i'm sure people can tell you which ones they normally use as well on the chat yes a few recommendations have been put on the chat yeah yes Great, thanks. Okay, so let's carry on. We'll get another opportunity to ask some more questions shortly. 
Um, so we're going to look at the network operator backbone design. So this is now the infrastructure backbone. This is the one that's connecting your various pops to one another, right? That's what constitutes your backbone. So like I said, the internet today is mostly about bringing um, service content closer to the, to the users, right? Closer to the access networks. So when you're an ISP, you're basically someone who's just connecting Facebook to everyone or Google to everyone, right? And for you to do that properly and to keep your customers happy, you want to make sure that you have uh, low latency links, right? You're able to, you're using the best path between places. So low latency links, you want to have high bandwidth, like I said, go for the highest that you can afford. If you can afford to have uh, 10G, then have a 10G SFP between two sites, right? Rather than um, being very much on the threshold of exactly how much traffic passes through there. So you want to have high bandwidth, um, you want to have content caching on your network, and you want to interconnect with um, other providers at the internet exchange point, and you want to have great transit to ensure that you're able to um, still have your own, the, your, your customers' destinations closer to you. So a transit provider was not uh, taking you around to the world to get to a resource is, is much better than one who has um, a less well-paired network, right? Which means you go further to get resources. Um, so the competition is just about the speed and the quality of the content delivery. And I think everyone can attest to that during this period of COVID, everyone wanted to have high internet connectivity, reliable internet connectivity in every forum we are in. It's always about my service provider did this. I can't even open that. So that is where the value lies for the customer. They want highly available services, which are really fast. So something to remember is that you don't have to, um, you don't want to be in a situation where you're being anti-competitive with your, with your, what are they called? Your competitors. Um, for instance, if, if two networks of the same size are at the IXP, it's best for them to save their money that they would have paid their transit provider by interconnecting to each other. So even though they, um, even though in the marketplace you're competing, you can still have some synergy that helps you um, give your customers better services. So don't shy away from things like peering with your, with your competitors. And then you want to also not avoid places or situations where you have uh, barriers to interconnection. So let's say, for instance, we've, we always speak about carrier neutral, carrier neutral data centers, right? Um, you want to be in a place where if once you're located there, you're freely able to interconnect with any other provider or any other service that you want that is available in that data center without being restricted by anyone. So for the most part, uh, in most backbones, we're doing a rooted backbone, which means you'll have all your different um, pops interconnected with um, IP across them. So you have um, your fiber connections between your pops, or even if it's wireless, um, but it's rooted. So you're not just um, switching across them. Um, so for now, the main technologies that people are using are ethernet, and there's still some operators who are also offering SDH services um, for, to, to interconnect um, uh, different locations. Um, so when you're having your, your POP design, so in a situation where you have more than one POP, we spoke about our core network, our core POP. It doesn't mean you're not going to have other different POPs in different areas where you're able to serve customers from. And one of the things, as we said, about the modular design in our core is that we want to have the same modular design um, across all our POPs, right? So that one of the key things to consider when you're designing your network is to think of a standard design, right? So that I know if I'm making a pop in a building, I will always take uh, one router with uh, 12 ports and one switch with 24 ports, right? And one and wireless antenna on the rooftop or something. So have a have a standard pop design that you have, or you have a customer edge, customer edge services router where you give people access to your network. And then you have another router, which is now for interconnecting back to your core, right? 
which will have the backbone link attached to it. So think of a, a standard design that you can have for a network and have one for, if I have a really small pop, which I'm just having a few customers, what should that design look like and for a medium and for a large. And the importance of this, first of all, when you standardize your design and even your configurations, it allows you to do things like automating your network. It's very difficult to automate when you're doing everything snowflakey, every site is special. Try and avoid that as much as possible. Try and think of a design that meets most of your needs uh, most of the times, right? And stick to that design because that makes it much easier to run your network. You'll be able to have spare, spare routers or spare devices or spare kit easily because you're using the same thing across, which means you can buy in bulk and have the cost savings on that. So when you're thinking about your design, think of something modular and think of something that is standardized. Then you don't have to only have your services only at your pop. You want to have some backup locations where you can offer your services. So if I have like my, my virtual servers at one location, say in Nairobi from in another data center, um, let's say I'm in EADC, I can have another backup location, maybe in Upper Hill, right? Mm. Where I also have some servers which can back up my primary site. So that's important to ensure as well. So if you can distribute some of your servers where possible across your backbone, then you'll be able to um, have a more resilient network. In case of a failure, a complete failure in one pop, you'll be able to actually survive and still uh, offer services. Um, I'll give you an example of uh, just a few months ago, I'm sure uh, Simon remembers when a big large data center in London was completely offline. Like the power tripped and that was it. There was no power in the whole data center, which hosts a good chunk of any network provider on the internet, any global service providers, any major content networks. And we were simply completely out on that side. And that would have been catastrophic if we never had any other points in our network where we are able to serve our customers or give redundant service or even pick up our own transit as well. So it's good as much as possible if you can distribute your connections between your different pops so that if you have a complete outage on one, you're able to recover and still offer at least a decent level of service for your customers. So this is just a diagram showing um, a network with like three pops and they've distributed some ISP services across them. You have, you're picking up different customers at the various pops and you're able to have some redundancy between them. Um, so for your backbone links, you're going to probably be looking at uh, fiber, right? For the most part, at least uh, wherever it's available and where it's cheap. So your first or your best preference would be to have dark fiber. If you can get dark fiber, it's best because you can control, um, you know, the, the capacity which you light it at. So if you have dark fiber, if today I have 1G and that's what my network is using and that's what I can afford, I'll use that. And if I now have more, more traffic across my network, I can just easily upgrade to 10G or 100G just by changing the equipment and the SFPs at, at both ends of the, of the dark fiber. Then you're also able to do things like CWDM, which allow you to channelize the fiber. So even with a single pair, you're able to have many more services crossing the same fiber, right? Um, if you can't get the dark fiber, then the other options that people normally have are like the wavelengths. You just get a, a wavelength from a different provider who allows you to connect your one pop to your other pop, right? So my EADC pop, let's say to my Colo pop, I can get a service provider who can give me a lambda between those two where I can have services across. Then for... Um, on the routers, you can have now the IP on Ethernet, or you can have SDH as well. Um, so just a brief summary of what uh, DWDM is. It's the dense wave division multiplexing, which means you can have very many small wavelengths um, across your device, um, across the one fiber pair that you have. Um, which is a bit costly because uh, you need specialized equipment. So your normal router is not just going to be able to do this and your normal SFP is not going to be able to do this. 
So you might need a bit um, more expensive equipment, but it gives you much more flexibility when, when you get to that stage of your network. And the cost wavelength division multiplexing, which is just still smaller bands, but gives you less, less wavelengths per fiber optic pair. So either of those options, depending on what's the number of services you need to get across. Um, so for long distance, um, usually it's, if you can't get dark fiber, then you're going to have to lease a managed service, which tends to be expensive. But the um, something important to note is don't just buy exactly what you need, always give yourself a little bit of headroom to grow into it. And usually for many providers, the more capacity you buy, the cheaper it is. So try and buy as much as you can, which gives you enough headroom to grow. Um, so while you're buying all this, um, capacity across your backbone in order to interconnect your major pops, you want to think of how much capacity is enough to have between them. So usually if you're having a very high quality uh, customers, you have, let's say corporate customers, they want to be, you want to be able to always offer them their services without having packet loss or congestion on your network. So when you think about this, I just wanted to go to this diagram so we can use it as an example. Um, you have this um, backbone links interconnecting the POPs. So you have POP1, POP2, and POP3. Um, so you want to consider what would happen if one of these uh, connections between my POPs went down. You want to be able to, if the link between POP2 and POP1 was down, you want to be able to reroute all the traffic that was originally flowing this way, plus all the traffic that was ideally using this link, POP1, POP2, you want it to be able to hopefully comfortably flow on the other alternate path. So that's something to consider. Because if this link only supports itself, then if you have a failure, you don't really have redundancy because you're just going to be dropping people's packets. So I'm not so sure if it's better to drop packets or just be down on the network. So you want to think about um, how much capacity you want to have and how much headroom you're going to give yourself. You're going to have very high quality customers. You want to do at least 50%. Um, if you're doing zero, it just means you're maybe serving some customers who are not paying that much and maybe will not be so sensitive um, to failures on your network. So because uh, this metropolitan area backbone links tend to be cheaper, these are what we tend to call local loops, right? Since those tend to, they tend to be cheaper, you can always try and get as much as you can um, from your provider because it's it's not going to cost you that much and it allows you to give um, to have redundancy and resiliency on your network in the case of failure or if you had to shut down one router to do an upgrade, you're able to do that comfortably without having to impact your customer and their level of service. If possible, you try and be as meshed as possible so that you are, if you have to say, for instance, I'm at POP1 and I have to service or maintain or any other reason, take uh, Coruta 1 offline, right? You'd still have connectivity back to POP2 because Coruta 2 probably has a link back to POP2. So in as much as possible, if you're able to mesh your network, if you're able to mesh your network, do that because it gives you more resiliency. And I hope you guys like to sleep. If you like to sleep, these are the type of designs you want to think about. So that when you have a failure, it's not um, catastrophic for you and you, you have enough time to recover from that um, failure on the network. Um, do you have any questions up till there? Kevin? Um, no questions on the chat. Um, anyone have a question? You can also uh, maybe uh, just a co uh, just just a comment. Michelle, you can highlight probably uh, any considerations uh, when uh, trying to choose uh, to go with metropolitan. I'm sure. Sorry. Uh, every John and James runs a metropolitan network. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I think one of the main ones you'd want to consider is someone who can give you a redundant service as well. 
You don't want them to have just one link on their network that can interconnect you. So even if they're giving you a managed service, it, you would likely want that to be a redundant managed service um, so that when they have a failure also on their own ring, you're able to still have, um, you want to still be able to have access between your two pops. That's one of the main ones I would think about um, in terms of choosing a, a provider. Um, um, you want to consider whether they have, I guess, infrastructure into your building and how they're able to connect you. What are they using? What's the technology that they're using to interconnect you? Because um, if you're connecting your own network, you want someone who's able to give you a transparent service um, between those two. So that for you, it's just a pipe that you're interconnecting those two networks, your two pops um, across. Um, what else, Simon, are you thinking of? Yeah, yeah, probably. I, I think I, I think uh, the redundancy part would be the the, the, the big plus because uh, you don't want like a fiber cut. You don't you don't a, a fiber cut like because of the the Nairobi is called uh, the expressway is being uh, you are being cut off and uh, you just say because uh, you understand it's being constructed. Um, yeah, but I think uh, uh, but basically on high level, uh, the, the easier way to see also if a network meets some. Um, global standardization because if a network tells you that they are MEF, stand, uh, MEF compliant mm -hmm. and uh, of course uh, they are normally published in a, in a portal which is, uh, which, which is normally only after test and verification, then mm -hmm. it will be easy for you to sign up with them even without testing their network because you can't get on that particular portal unless you've been extensively tested by the MEF bodies. Uh, to pass that um, network capability. Yeah. Uh, thanks for that, Simon. Okay. Um, is there another question? Did someone uh, uh, want to raise a question? Let me see. Um, there's a comment on the chat uh, from uh, Philip. He says, you can also comment on considerations for POP transport uh, backhaul. Uh, there are two VPN. VPLS, MPLS, layer three VPN, yeah. et cetera. Mm. Yeah, that's what we were talking about. Like I said, you want someone who's able to give you a transparent service. So whether it's whatever type of VPN they use or whichever technology they give you, you want it to just be something that for you, you get a straight circuit at the end. And that's what um, I think someone was also talking about. Carrier, carrier grid, right? You want a carrier ethernet type of service. Um, across your, your backbone. Or even if you just have like a direct link, you know, even if you're having a wireless, um, wireless, um, wireless connection between both of those um, devices. Uh, one uh, last question from Samuel. Talk about best practices when multi-homing, connecting to multiple ISPs. Okay, that's, that's like, it's a whole other big topic. But if I had to say something like just a quick sound bite for multi homing, we're going to do some more webinars and we're going to go deep into that. Um, but if I had a sound bite for if you're multi homing, um, I would say you have to always announce your prefixes, announce your aggregate prefixes to everywhere you're announcing your prefixes. So if you're having two providers, make sure you announce your full block that you have gotten from Afrinic, okay? Then you can do other load balancing tricks and all that stuff, but always make sure you announce your full, um, your full aggregate block. Um, yeah, and we'll, we'll talk more about that, hopefully maybe in the routing section and also in future webinars, we're going to go into how exactly to go about multi-homing um, and achieve all the different scenarios you would be thinking about. So we hope to see you there. Thanks, Michelle. I don't see any other question unless um, someone wants to unmute themselves and ask. That's a good then. Let's just go on because I'm, I'm looking at the time here and okay. we're running short. So let's go. Um, right. So addressing. Addressing me. I'm now going to speak about um, IP addresses, right? And as we know, um, we're running out of um, IPv4 addresses. 
So we're looking at probably IPv6, right? Or at, at the very least having um, a dual stack network where you have your IPv4, but now you're trying to deploy IPv6 and you're kind of doing dual stack. Dual stack means like, let's say if I have an interface, I have an IPv4 address for it. And I also have an IPv6 address for it. So IPv4 and IPv6 are independent protocols. So whatever is happening with your IPv4 doesn't have to have an impact on what you're doing with your IPv6. And that's one of the benefits of that. Um, you're able to run them in parallel, but without a failure on one impacting the other protocol. So even now, getting IP address space from Afrinic is actually quite difficult. They're getting, they're giving now slash 22s is the most that a provider can get. And you have to literally prove that you actually require that address space and that you're going to use it and how you're going to use it. On the flip side, I have the IPv6 address space. There's plenty of address, IPv6 address space available. So if you want that, an operator is given a slash 32, which is like way more IP address space than they would likely need. And um, yeah, and that's what's easily available from the registry, from the internet registry, which for us is Afrinic. So um, in summary, when you have this um, IPv4 and IPv6 in, du in dual stack, then you're able to do something called happy eyeballs, which means like um, the, the services that you're using will determine which of them is offering better connectivity and use that. Right? So if IPv4, if IPv4 to Facebook is better in my region, then I'll be served using IPv4. But if I have an IPv6 address and it's better over IPv6 and the network supports it, then I will be served over IPv6. So it's just whichever of the transports responds fast to the, to the connection requests. Um, so where do you get an IP address space? Um, for Africans, we get our IP address space from Afrinic and Afrinic is just the internet registry. So they've been assigned this IP block from a global body called IAM in the world. And they give each different region a set of resources that they can then assign to service providers in those regions. So Afrinic has their website where you can go and you can request you in order to get resources from Afrinic, you need to become a member, right? So a member is, has to have some requirements. You have to meet some requirements. Some of them is you have to be actually licensed in your market if you're a service provider with the necessary ones. And then you need to obviously be a company and show your company documents. You need to show them that you have a network or the type of network you're planning to build um, and how you're going to use those IP addresses so that they can prove that. Because those resources are for Africa. They want to make sure that those resources are actually used in Africa. So they need uh, mechanisms and methods to prove that. So those are some of the things they look at. So as you can see, you need IP address space. And if you don't have a license, you can't get them. So um, for those of us who are running our Chiniamachi ISVs, um, when you want to grow and want to scale and become independent, you definitely have to um, get a license so that you're able to get your own resources and run your network and grow and offer reliable services to your customer. Otherwise, you can't peer with anyone, which means you can't save any money from your uh, service provider at the moment unless you have your own IP address space. So it's something that you want to consider um, getting if you're not licensed and so that you're able to run your own network um, effectively. So like I said, for V6, you can get slash 32. Uh, for V4, you can get up to slash 22 if you can show how you're going to use it. Um, the other alternative as a service provider is to get IP address space from your upstream, right? But the minute you get IP address from your upstream, they don't have that much IP address space themselves, which means you're going to end up doing something that's not so fun, which is called NATing. And NAT has its limitations that will impact um, your services, especially for your very sensitive customers and a host of other problems. Um, and it also means you can't move from your service network design. Because say for instance, I have two providers. Both of them give me some IP address space. It means I can only use the provider who gave me the IP address space to reach those resources, if that makes sense, right? Um, 
So that limits you in terms of how you use the IPs on your network. It means you have to give a portion of your network services or servers certain IPs and the other portion, the other IPs from your other provider, which means you don't have actual redundancy. So if one of your service providers network fail, then your part of your network or your whole network will be down. So your fate is tied to theirs. If they mess up with their IP addressing, then your fate is also still tied to theirs. And so when you have your own address space, you're, e you're able to um, multi-home, which means you can have more than one service provider. It's easier for you to move from one provider to another because you never have to renumber your network. All your numbers, all your addressing remains the same while your, um, your service provider changes. And that's something which is really important for you. Um, what about um, RFC 1918? These are just simply the private address space. What about using that? Um, you can use that on LANs, but if you want to, for your infrastructure, right? You want to be able to reach your infrastructure from anywhere in the globe. Remember that the private address space is not routable over the internet. Which means if I'm at home and my router has a private IP, um, it will be quite difficult for me to log into it remotely and such stuff. So you want to have um, public address space for your, for your infrastructure at the very least. Your lands and the rest you can have now um, the private IP address space. Um, um, yeah, same goes for the carrier grade NAT um, IP address space as well. It's still private. It can't be routed over the internet, um, which means that it's still not as effective as having your own publicly available and routed IP address space. Um, yeah. So when you're NATing, some of the challenges that you can have, uh, which is a challenge of using the IP, the private IP address space, is for most part, uh, many people believe that NAT gives them security. That if I NAT, they won't know it was this device that did that or whatever the case may. It might be you might think you're protected from security threats that exist on the internet and, and the like, which is not true because those can still be overcome. Um, when you have NAT, it impacts trace route, so troubleshooting becomes much more difficult. You can have weird NAT implementations from a provider or a vendor who's just decided to do their own crazy stuff, which breaks um, services for your customers. And it can be really difficult to isolate and figure out. Because for you, like, I'm just having frequent disconnections to this, um, let's say this server, and no one can trace the reason why. So. Some of those things um, make it really difficult to troubleshoot and resolve issues easily on your network. Um, then, yeah, so there's obviously the impact with DNS and all that. So it makes it just much difficult to run your network if you're running it or behind a, a NAT, a NATed resource. So in as much as you can, um, try and uh, get your own IP address space. especially for your infrastructure. So in terms of why not NAT, um, you can't NAT also when you have a large, large pool of customers, because there's a limitation of NAT, how many, how many um, sessions it can support, right? Or how many TCP or UDP port it can have at any given moment. So at some point you'll be unable to actually serve some customers if your network has grown very large. Um, and then it breaks the end-to-end -end model of IP, which means you can't tell where's the beginning and where's the end, because then you're behind this one resource, which is now um, breaking it up into various different sessions using port numbers, um, and it impacts security. Um, yeah, and breaks some, some user, some types of traffic uh, not friendly with NAT. So typically you can see like for, um, for NAT, some of the limitations. For a user device, you can have up to 400 sessions typically, or TCP, UDP ports per IPv4. Uh, you get like 130K different um, UDP ports that you can use, um, which means that you can only have about uh, 320 users using one IP address. So if you're serving more than that, then 
just having even only one IP is not going to be sufficient for you. So, did I go further back? Yeah. Yeah, so thinking about how you handle the NAT on your network is um, quite important. Um, and if it's possible, you can avoid it. Um, and then try and avoid those situations where you get into this situation where you have double NAT. So one device has NATed the IPs, and then another different device along the path in your network is also um, is also NATing IPs. So it becomes it can get really messy really quickly. It also makes it difficult also to find out who's doing what on the network and resolving it. Um, so let's just, I'm just gonna skip this and go into IPv6 addressing plans. Um, because there isn't much IPv4 address space left, it would be a good idea to figure out how would I use this IPv6 address space if I got it, right? So we said that an operator is given a slash 32. So for the slash 32, they get it from the internet registry, they're given the block. And obviously if you get an IP address, you also get an ASN, just so you know. So you want an IP and an ASN, otherwise you're not, uh, your network cannot be uniquely identified on the internet. And you'll be unable to um, do BGP as effectively as you would want to. Um, so for uh, the slash 32, how do you segment it and break it down so that you have a kind of an IP address plan that you can um, then use to address your network? And like I said, remember when you go to the registry, they ask you how you're going to use this address space. These are some of the things that you need to think about when you're saying this is how I plan to break up this address space that you're giving me. So for your loopbacks, your loopbacks are simply those uh, interfaces on your network, they are virtual and they don't go down and usually use them as the, your router identifier for your different routing processes. So out of your slash 32, you'll take a slash 64, which is now what is considered a LAN in, in, in V6. So you'll take one of those and then you'll break up um, one from that um, slash 64, you'll be able to create slash 28, 128. So the full, size of uh, IPv6 address is 128 bits, I guess, yeah. Which means if I'm doing a slash 128 is similar to a slash 32 in IPv4 speak, right? So you want to break those up into slash 128 for each loopback. Um, then from there, you want to now further break down this slash 32 you got into um, a slash 48 for each customer. Say if I have a customer, not for each customer, so for each region. So for a pop, I can say for my pop one, I'll give it a slash 48 where I'm used to address everything in that pop. If I get a customer there, I'll just get a piece of uh, another slash 64 or 56 from the 48 and I'll give it to my customer to use it as their IP address space, which will be sufficient enough for them to go and further break it down on their network and address all their needs, their addressing needs on their network. Then, um, so the slash 48 can be pop up or per region. And then you can have another separate slash 48 for your whole backbone. So we said our backbone is um, all the interpop links that we have. And even from this slash 48 for your backbone, you can also address your NOC, um, all your servers, your monitoring servers. You can give them IP address space from that backbone um, block that you've saved. Um, so usually for your infrastructure, you don't have to, um, make sure that your subnet can be aggregated because uh, typically you just use a point to point which will be like a slash 126 or 127. So you can give any IP, you don't have to confine it to a region, you just give them out, but they'll come from that particular block that you saved for your backbone. So whenever you see an IP address in that range, you know it's speaking about something that's in your own infrastructure and not something that you've assigned to a customer. Um, and then you can summarize um, address space between the, the different sites if, if, it, if necessary, but always at the edge. Like I said, when you're announcing your block to your transit or to your peers, make sure you announce your aggregate to them. And which is a similar strategy as you would use for IPv4. So you break up the address space to save some for your lookbacks some for your customer assignments, 
and some for your own network um, backbone utilization for your infrastructure and the like. It's the same um, thinking if you're doing IPv4. Um, and then in terms of a LAN, we say the LAN is uh, slash 64. In, in the case of, uh, since the V6 addresses are so many, each interface is kind of thought of as a LAN. So even though you're not using the whole slash 64 on an interface, you can assign a slash 64 to an interface um, and then only use a slash 127 for the particular point to point, right? Um, because with IPv6, not like IPv4 where you have only one IP address on an interface, you can have as many as you want. So I can have 10 primary IPv6 addresses on one interface if I want to. Whereas in IPv4, you'd have like primary, and then you'd have the rest being secondary IP addresses. With V6, it's not the same. It's just as many as you want to put on that interface, depending on how you're using them, it's possible for you to do that. So you can reserve a 64 for the, for the interface or for the link, but only use a slash 127 for it, um, which makes it much easier for you to subnet as well. Then for your NOC, like I said, it's part of your infrastructure and your backbone. You want to give it the slash 48, where you have all your network staff, your staff use um, the same IPs from the slash 48 you reserved for the NOC, your management, your monitoring systems, and all the rest, um, and all your critical systems. So you can give them their own um, slash 64, that, um, their own 48, and from that 48, you can break it down further to the different services that you're providing across your backbone, as we saw in the, in the modular design that we were looking at. And then for customers, you can just give them a slash 48, 56 or, or so that they can use on their network. And for that, you want to carry those IP addresses across your infrastructure, like you said, using BGP. So we said we use our IGP for um, routing our infrastructure IPs, right? So that your router knows, how do I get to the router in in Mombasa, I know that the next hop is this particular IP, but that's only for that. But if you're trying to figure out how do I reach the customer in Mombasa, I'll get that information from BGP. So that's what I mean about um, separating the two of them. Okay. Um, yeah, so for IPv6 addresses, we said you can give your customers a slash 48, or if they're smaller, um, you can give them a slash 56, and if it's just a LAN um, network, they can have a slash 64, which gives them enough flexibility. And V6 also has all the features that you can have for IPv4. So in the same way that you give a specific address to your infrastructure, you can give LAN addresses using you know, DHCP, just like you would with IPv4, so you don't have to think about how will I remember all these addresses. You can still use the same techniques like um, DHCP in order to address the network and then give uh, devices and the like IP addresses. And remember I spoke about um, DNS and if you're using V6, DNS becomes extremely critical for you because you can't remember all those IP address spaces. And when you're like troubleshooting, especially your infrastructure, you want to have those links given their unique DNS names. So you have to come up with like a, a naming convention that you can use for naming interfaces and sites so that you're able to tell, oh, okay, this is how this traffic is flowing. When I'm doing a trace route, it's easy to tell. Otherwise, if you just stare at those large number of um, numbers and letters, it becomes very difficult for you to troubleshoot and debug and figure out what's going on in your network. And also you have to remember to document all this stuff that you've done, the customer allocations that you've done and the rest documentation is extremely critical in V6. So do we have a question up to there? Uh, thanks, Michelle. No questions on the chat uh, at the moment. Um, anyone with a question? You can type on chat or unmute yourself. Going once. Okay, um, let's just continue. I think we only have a couple more minutes. Let's see if we can 
get to security. So now we're talking about um, the type of routing protocols you want to have on your network. And um, I've spoken already a little bit about it. So we can probably go through this quickly. Um, so for routing protocols, we said we have interior gateway protocols. And these are the ones which you use to address um, resources and things inside your own network. And we said these are for your infrastructure. So these are things like your point-to-point -point links. And I gave you some examples of um, interior gateway protocols, which are like OSPF, ISIS, I guess other people use EIGRP, um, but these are the, like the, what are they called? When, when they're vendor neutral, they're open standards. So these are the ones which are open, um, OSPF, ISIS and the like. So you'd want to select one of those to be your IGP. And then um, these exterior gateway protocols, and these are, there's only one at the moment, and that is uh, BGP. And the version of BGP that we're using is version four, right? So this we said, we'll always use it to carry our customer prefixes across our network and obviously for our internet routes, right? That's what you use. So you have two options. You have one for IGP and BGP. Um, so why do you need an IGP? We said the reason that you want to separate um, your your infrastructure routes from your customer and your internet routes is because um, when you have that modular structure, it limits the scope of failure. So like I said, when a link goes down, you don't have to cause um, every single device plus your customers to reconverge, right? Because that will impact their, their service um, availability. If you have a flapping link, you can imagine what that does to your customer's um, service and their QoS. So separating those ensures that you can offer more stable services and it's also easier to troubleshoot, right? So I can't tell, because your, your infrastructure IPs are so few, it's very easy to quickly troubleshoot, figure out what's going on with the routing protocol or what exactly has broken. But if you add like the internet uh, routes into your IGP, um, don't ever try that at home. Um, you will cause a cast, yeah, horrible failure on your, on your device, it will probably fall over and die. So having that uh, separated ensures that you're able to limit the scope of failure and recover quickly and offer scalable or stable services for your customers. Uh, and so why do we use the EGP? Because the first of all, EGP or GP is the only way to connect to another network. So that's one of the reasons you would use it. It's the only way to participate on the internet as a network, you need to do BGP. Um, and it controls the reachability to prefixes. So the reason that BGP was designed is because it allows you to apply policy to your, to your routing, right? You're able to do the routing policy to say, um, this customer can get access to these resources or not, or I want to use this service provider's network to reach these resources or not. So all the things, all the nitty gritty of how you want to do your business or offer your services, you can actually write those down and um, control um, a large section of them via BGP. So that's one of the main reasons actually people use BGP. It's kind of like a policy protocol, more so than a reachability one. Um, and with that BGP, you can still use it in conjunction with multiple IGPs. So let's look at some differences between the two. So for an interior routing protocol, you have automatic neighbor discovery, which means if I turn on between a point to point and I turn on an IGP, um, as long as my, as long as my um, settings are the same or depending on what that protocol requires um, on both ends, it will automatically detect that, oh, actually that's, um, that's a neighbor, that router is a neighbor that I can connect to. So it will automatically detect that uh, neighbor and be able to bring up a session with them. And um, generally there's trust in your IBGP, I, IGP because those are all pieces of infrastructure you control. So you never ever ever want to do um, OSPF or ISIS with another network, okay? So never do ISIS with your service provider or OSPF with your service provider because it means then you have access to each other's network and you don't have that boundary that's created by the exterior gateway protocol. Then prefixes, um, 
the, all the routers have the same view of the network in most IGPs. So it means that um, if I am this router in Nairobi, I can tell that the router in Mombasa is down, just as my neighbor can tell by themselves that the router in Mombasa is down. Because we're all receiving all this um, routing information and we're coming up with a view of the network and it should be a similar view of the network. We know all the same links are down, ideally, or up. Then it obviously binds all the routers in one autonomous system together. We said you use it inside your own network. That's your autonomous system. It's a network with which you have control over the policy in that network. On the flip side, for the exterior gateway protocols, we have um, you have to specifically configure BGP to your peer, right? I can never just turn on BGP on my router and it detects the other neighbor. It's very specific and very explicit in the, in the configuration. I have to say I'm connecting to this router. I am AS37271 and I want to connect to AS37100. I must configure that and they must configure that very explicitly in order for you to have a session between each other. And then we said we use it to connect um, other networks which are outside of our networks. It sets the administrative boundary. So this is um, the boundary of your autonomous system. This is the partner you no longer have control over, except what you accept or what you send out to your, to your uh, peers or your, um, yeah, your IP transit or whatever. They're called BGP neighbors. And then it binds ASS together. So this is how the internet mesh is created. All the different networks do BGP with one another until all of a sudden everyone is in one large mesh and connected to each other. So again, you only use your infrastructure IP addresses in your interior protocol, and you want to keep it small for efficiency and scalability, right? Then for exterior, you want to carry your customer prefixes or anything that is not your infrastructure and carry your internet prefixes. And um, it doesn't rely on the topology of your, your IGP, right? In order to, to form those sessions or carry those routes. So just as an example, for where you use what, we said BGP is with other autonomous systems. So to other ISPs, um, to your customers, some of them can use static or BGP, depending. And then to the IXP, you must use BGP. That's the only way you'll be able to connect with other service providers. So when you're choosing IGP, there's always the discussion, which one should I choose? Should I choose OSPF or ISS? For me, I said, um, both of them are quite similar. At this time, they've developed very much to be both robust protocols. But like I said, for OSPF, if you want to do V6, you have to run OSPF version one and I mean OSPF version two and version three, which just for, for us as operators want to think about maintainability and oper operatability, I guess. Um, you want it to be as simple as possible to troubleshoot your network and to maintain and to figure out what's going wrong and to also limit the number of places you touch where you can cause things to go wrong. So that's in that's the only thing that would make me say um, use ISIS over OSPF. And other than that, it's what you're more, more comfortable with. You can try both of them out as long as you know how to run the network and troubleshoot it, whichever protocol suits you best, um, um, you could use it with equal success. Um, yeah, so with that, we just said that uh, for IGP, you want to keep it, that routing table for your IGP as small as possible. Keep it only to your backbone, your point-to-point -point links, and um, have your loopbacks. You don't have to, what's it called, summarize the IP addresses in your IGP, because it's not really necessary. And, um, and also remember to use authentication as well. So just because you, you trust obviously your router or the routers in your network, uh, but these protocols also have a, a layer of security that you can use, which means I can have a password for the two routers to become neighbors with one another. And that can prevent someone else who maybe has figured out what your IP is, but if they don't know your password, then a rogue person, a malicious person would be able to come and just connect to your router and somehow form a neighborship because we said the, the neighbor discovery is automatic. So having a password increases and gives you that added layer of um, security. Uh, 
Um, so these are just some other tips. Um, you can also further reduce the size of your uh, IGP table by using um, unnumbered interfaces where, whereby you can have um, a point to point without any specific IP address um, associated with it. And then um, you can use the contiguous, like I said, you have a block that you've used which you're going to use across the whole backbone. So that's the one which you'll have summarized, right? And, um, but don't summarize your loopback addresses because the loopback addresses are used um, as, um, for many protocols as router identifiers that helps the, the protocol detect where did I land this from? How do I get there and all of that. And like I said, we'll do, we'll do a routing, um, we'll do a routing tutorial then hopefully something practical next year, I guess. We'll see how the COVID goes. And finally, so I, IBGP, so this uh, it can be a little confusing. We said EBG, we said BGP is an external gateway protocol, but there's the version called IBGP, which is exactly the same. It's only that it's between the same AS, right? So we said for your customer prefixes across your network, you want to use you want to carry them over BGP. So that version of BGP, which is within the same AS, is called IBGP. And the only thing that makes it different from eBGP is that you're having the same AS as a remote AS. Um, so you carry your, your internet routing table. Once you've learned it from your border routers, you'll carry it across your network using BGP. That's how all the routers in your network are going to learn about the available routes and also your customer addresses. That's how they're going to be propagated across your network and all your summarized um, address base, your customer point to point. Links which you've aggregated, those can also be in um, BGP. So in order for you to scale your BGP, um, some of the things you'd want to consider, they will be said to do uh, password in your IGP, let's say I have OSPF, I can have a password to bring up the neighborship. It's the same feature you can have for BGP. Just have a password um, for the neighbors that they can use with one another in order for them to authenticate and ensure that they're actually um, peering and not with the right router and not a rogue person who somehow gotten um, access to your network. So just for an added layer of security, you can uh, use authentication in those sessions. And then other things such as peer groups, which are just like grouping similar things together to make it easier for you to configure. So if I'm having the same configuration for many customers, um, how it works in general is just having like a shared group of characteristics that I assign to that customer and makes it easier for me to quickly turn up a customer. I don't have to write everything in my configuration again, but I simply associate my new customer BGP session with a peer group which has similar qualities or uh, configurations as my customer. And like I said, we will look into the, like the practicals of that in upcoming webinars. Then um, you can also use things called communities um, for additional filtering and the like, and root reflectors. So in, in, I, in IBGP, another difference between IBGP and eBGP is that in IBGP, uh, a router can only tell its neighbor about routes it learned via eBGP, okay? Because they're in the same network, all the routers don't want to say actually have, and they're all learning the same things. It's just a way to prevent um, loops from forming where each, each router is saying, I have, a net, I have a route to this network, yet it learned it from its neighbor. So how IBGP works is that, for any route to be announced to another IBGP speaker or neighbor, it must have been learned from eBGP. Um, so for IBGP, you have to have a full mesh. All the routers in your network which want to speak IBGP have to have sessions with one another so that you make sure all the traffic goes across the network. So this thing we're calling a route reflector is basically something that helps you um, overcome this limitation. And it allows um, you to reduce the size of the 
your routine um, configuration and mesh by assigning some routers. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, sorry. Okay. Yeah, by assigning some routers um, with the responsibility of um, announcing IBGP land routes to other IBGP speakers. So that's a root reflector, sort of how a root reflector works. Um, do you have any questions up till then? Uh, there's one question in the chat uh, from Samuel. Uh, EIGRP was released to be an open standard by Cisco. Does anyone in attendance know if there's any other vendor who has implemented EIGRP in their code? Who has implemented? Other vendors. Oh, who other vendors. Other vendors. Vendor. Yeah. Hmm. Oh, I don't even know. I don't Cisco. even check for it. Yeah, I've actually not. Uh, <laughs> I don't think many people check for that. So maybe Sam, uh, you, you, you can forward that to the mailing list of the WhatsApp group. Yeah, uh, yeah. what have their experiences been? That would, that would be an interesting one to hear about. Yeah, and, 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 and also especially it being a distance vector, I don't think, uh, I mean, its usability is limited. So most of the vendors have not thought of even including it in, into, the, into the code, especially mm. given that it was uh, built by Cisco because it will have so much limitations whereby you have a dependability on Cisco to be able to, to develop it. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Because um, I think like open standards have more people working on the problem. So they also tend to be uh, much better and the features are kept more up to date. So probably why you might not see too many people um, working on that. And then also vendors go where the money is. They, they're not really concerned about putting all the protocols into their boxes. They want to know which protocols are people interested in. And if people are interested in OSPF and ISS, they're not going to waste their time, their resources and their money, because at the end of the day, it's business in, in developing those protocols further. Um, do we have another question? Uh, no more questions. Okay, so now I have a question. Um, I think we're time up, isn't it, Kevin? Yeah, we are. That would make it one and a half hours. So yes, yeah. we're more or less. Uh, uh. Okay, so um, from everyone here, since you're the ones who joined, uh, would you like to go over the infrastructure and routing security before we close, or should we um, pick this up? Um, in another session. Please answer on the chat. Uh, oh, and so basically, we. Oh, you can put your hands up. There's a raise your hand feature, so we can use that as a poll. Yes. Yeah. So just raise your hand up if you think you want to continue, or if you, if you don't want to continue, just don't raise your hand up. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I see eight hands up. Uh, then some okay. comments. Go on, please. How long will it take you for this one? Infrastructure and routing skills. Let me see if it says there. Um, this is a bit, it's a bit heavy. So if you're feeling tired, um, we'd rather do it. Um, it's only, it's about 20 slides. Um, yeah, 20 slides is like, another 20 minutes maybe 30 so we can pick it up i can make it what we can do then in that case because we reached like the infrastructure and routing security part we can make it uh the next one we do like a routing security webinar so that we do this part yeah. and um, we can go into the details yeah. of, of how to do the routing security does that sound good Sounds good to me. Um, we can also follow up on, on chat. Uh, so yeah, if it's another 20, 30 minutes, uh, we can see how to schedule that with something else. Yeah, it's fine. So I'll, I'll, what I'll do, then I'll make the next webinar uh, uh, 
addressing security web you know, then we can just talk about how to protect our our networks okay um, yeah, yeah so I, th I think this one we can com we can combine with the, the upcoming security uh, which will capture like uh, maybe a deep dive dive into the uh infrastructure security for yeah 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 um, that's fine we can do that so um yeah that's okay and you also have the slides so you can actually go through them they're on the on the whatsapp i share them with everyone and as well as on the mailing list so i mean you can always read and um, still benefit from the knowledge that is there and feel free to ask any questions if you're stuck or if something isn't clear uh, we're on the mailing list um so use that and then we can chat there it will be much more robust for us and it will also be saved for future when other people join the group they'll be able to go there and read what we discussed um, in the past. So if you haven't joined the mailing list, um, please uh, hop on over and join, thanks. Yes. Um, so uh, so um, kindly, I've shared the URL to join the mailing list. Um, the WhatsApp group was full last time, but uh, let me just share the link. You can try your luck. Maybe a few people uh, dropped out. Um, but uh, thank you very much, uh, Michelle. That was um, uh, very well done. I'm sure um, everyone has enjoyed that. So let me get this. So that's the WhatsApp group, but. Um, it's not a lot of space left. The better one to use is the mailing list where we're going to circulate uh, all the information. Yes, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll also record the call. We'll uh, put it online on the YouTube channel later on. Great. Okay. Um, yeah, anything else, uh, Michelle, Simon? No, no, it's cool. Um, I think we can do a quick poll and see when would be a good time to do the next sessions. Um, yeah, but thank you for joining. Thank you for your questions and for your attention. Uh, we appreciate it. Um, don't forget to join the mailing list. Yeah, so maybe, um, uh, Kevin, just because of time and uh, we see also maybe running into this, uh, as Michelle had mentioned, we have COVID with, with us. If it were not for it, we could be having the physical one. So probably next year, the physical ones, it will be like a full day whereby you can be able yeah. now to, to like touch all topics uh, uh, like a track, if it's routing, if it's systems, mm -hmm. and any other um, stream. Yeah, and do something more hands on as well, because I know it's um, yeah, it's a good thing for everyone to understand how, how these things work and to get to test it out away from their network <laughs> before they go and implement. So, yeah, well, let's see how, how things go, and then we'll make a plan for, for uh, workshops. Yeah, yes, indeed. Okay, thank you again, uh, Michelle. Uh, that was fantastic. Um, thanks everyone for making time for, for the uh, tutorial today. Uh, please join the mailing list. Uh, we are certainly going to send all the information there. I've shared a few more uh, URLs. Um, the WhatsApp group is, is uh, full, unfortunately, but we are uh, communicating on the mailing list and more and more. So you'll find all the information there. I've shared the link to the YouTube channel as well. Uh, we've uh, uploaded a couple of past uh, webinars uh, from that we've done so you can uh, follow them as well uh, we are working on another tutorial uh, perhaps before the end of the month uh, information will be on the mailing list as well so if you uh, enjoyed this uh, content you can expect more uh, coming soon uh, have a good um, rest of the day uh, look forward to seeing you on the mailing list thank you everyone thank you have a good one thanks bye